Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. Ever since the senseless massacre of the striking mine workers in Marikana last year, people have much greater awareness of the struggles of mine workers. But behind the mine workers is another group of people. The wives, the mothers, the daughters, the sisters. These are the women behind the mine workers. These are the women that live in mining communities. The Marikana massacre most certainly turned the spotlight on the women in mining communities by bringing into sharp focus the widows of the slain mine workers. Tragically, the Marikana widows are still waiting for justice as the Farlem Commission of Inquiry is making painfully slow progress. As we sit here today, we are no closer to the truth about what happened on that tragic day when the mine workers lost their lives. Meanwhile, the lives of their widows are in limbo. Not only have they lost their loved ones, but they have also lost their family's breadwinners. Today we are talking about the impact of mining on women. And we're going to have the discussion with Samantha Hargreaves. She is the coordinator of WOMEN. WOMEN is a regional platform that unifies African women in the fight against resource extraction that destroys land, ecosystems and livelihoods. Welcome to Saxus, Samantha. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. Samantha, um, WOMEN was launched a few days ago at the Constitutional Hill, the Women's Jail, as I understand yes, it. Yes, that's correct. Your organization is looking specifically at the impact of mining on women. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is the impact of mining on women? Sure. Um, so WOMEN, as you've explained, is a regional program looking at women, gender and the extractive sector. The impacts of mining on women in the region are diverse. Um, the first major impact that our studies have shown and that our work with communities on the ground has revealed is that with extractives often comes large-scale land loss. So land grabs is a great feature of the extractive sector. And because women are the major producers of food in sub-Saharan Africa, in fact 60 to 80 percent of food that is consumed within rural households is grown by women, the impact of land grabs is greatest on women because they are the major producers of, of food on the continent. Um, it's very complicated by the fact that Women's land rights are often very tenuous in rural areas as well because they often live under communal tenure systems which over centuries from colonization through post-colonization where there's been a failure to really reform and strengthen these systems means that women often do not have a voice in these communities because they're not seen as rights holders. The land is generally vested in a man, whether it's husband, brother, father. And so women's rights of access to land in communal tenure systems is through a man, it's mediated through a man. So when there are decisions about whether to proceed with extractive projects, uh, women's voices are generally quite silent in those communities. The challenge more generally for communities that are confronting extractive industries is that often you will have a traditional leader or a traditional council that will act for the community and they will make decisions to proceed with the extractors project without consulting the community as a whole. So that's a more general problem for all rural communities. And I would imagine that it's the women in those communities that don't have a voice when these decisions are made. Yes, because women marry into traditional communities and are necessarily seen as members or membership of a unit comes through their husbands. So women generally do not participate in decision making. So that's the, the food, the land grabs and food production impacts of extractives is one major area of impact for women. The second that is linked is water grabs. Um, mining second to industrial agriculture is the greatest consumer of water. And what happens is you have industries, and in this case mining, that are then competing for domestic water users, against domestic water users, and against subsistence and small-scale farmers. And so what you see is you see the grabbing of water 
um, for the industrial scale mining, leaving communities with very little water for agricultural production or with polluted water supplies which they then cannot use for agricultural production either. Coming to the area of polluted water, this is a critical area of impact for women and in fact on the solidarity visits we had as part of this woman meeting last week, we visited Mpumalanga which is the centre of coal mining in South Africa, or well, I think Limpopo is going to soon be competing with, with, with Mpumalanga. But there you can see the great impacts of acid mine drainage to the point that communities in most of these areas can no longer drink the water. So they're relying on water that's being brought in from outside or from local church or, or um, um, religious groups that are providing safe water supplies. But very poor communities are actually having to buy water supplies now as well because often water is not sufficient. And this has terrible impacts on women because of the division of labour within households which see women as primarily responsible for the provisioning of safe water supplies for their families. So it means when water supplies are no longer safe, it's women that then have to struggle with limited resources to purchase or find the water, often walking great distances to find safe water. And when children or household members fall ill, which they do from polluted water supplies, it's women that then have to nurse their household members back to health. Um, the third or fourth major area of impact is around women's bodies. And this is quite an under-researched and, and poorly understood area. We obviously know about significant levels of violence against women in the region and in South Africa in particular. But in these extractive areas which attract large numbers of men as workers, um, both for the primary and secondary linked industries, um, you have a significant influx of men, you have women losing uh, resources they rely on for livelihoods, leaving women often with little choice but to sell their bodies. And so in the extractive industries, in the industries and, and surrounding them amongst the communities, you have women who are transacting sex to make a living. Um, Samantha, tell me about something you mentioned before this interview when we spoke before. Mm. You talked about unpaid labour, mm -hmm. the unpaid labour of women. Mm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think this is a critical question. Um, and in fact, it's in a lot of the work that's been done on the extractives industries, this is barely mentioned. Um, the unpaid labour impacts take many different forms. So when you have men migrating from rural communities to the mines, as Walpay theorised in the 70s, they're leaving behind a rural family. And in fact, the mining companies have historically always factored into account the labour of principally women in those rural communities that continue to produce food in subsistence agriculture systems. And the mining companies considered this as an input to the reproduction of the family and the, the wage labourer, the mine worker. What is also happening as a more significant feature since the end of apartheid in South Africa is that men have, have moved out of compounds into mining communities, usually in formal settlements around the mines, and they get a living out wage, which is about 1,800 rand or 180 US dollars. Um, and that is supposed to, bizarrely, um, accommodate all of their reproduction. So it's supposed to house them, provide water, roads, um, the general services that a person would require to reproduce themselves. And so built into this living wage, um, I mean, into this uh, subsidy, um, living out allowance, is, a, is, is an assumption that people in their community, and this would be women's labour, would be deployed to reproduce these mine workers and their families. And so it's women in these informal settlements that are under very difficult circumstances reproducing the mine worker and his dependents. Um, and that's harvesting water, um, dealing with sick children because there's no sanitation, there's inadequate health services, so it forced a woman to take care of members of their family, there are no roads, this creates additional work because of mud within homes or on clothing. So these are some examples of the way in which women's unpaid labour subsidises the mining corporation's profits. The third area is around illness that arises from the mining industries. And this is both in terms of the male mine workers who after decades of work under 
underground, often contract diseases, often, well, TB, HIV AIDS, which is very closely and intimately linked to the mining industry, and then diseases of the lungs, such as asbestosis, as it applied to the asbestos mining industry, and silicosis around the gold mining. These men become very ill, they basically suffocate to death, and so they would return home. Often the mining companies would just repatriate the workers to die at home so that the costs of them caring for these sick workers would not fall to the mining corporation. And so it has been women in, in rural communities that even to this day are subsidizing the mining companies and stepping into full and significant breach or gap on the part of the state that's not providing basic services in rural communities to then take care of these sick workers. Uh, Samantha, um, tell me about some of the mining communities that you visited. Uh, you talked about the coal mining community that you visited in Mpumalanga, am I right? Mm -hmm. um, but were there other communities that you visited and what did you see? We also spent time in Marikana on that trip, that second trip to the northwest. And in Marikana, in, uh, very soon after the massacre, women in Marikana started organizing. Basically it's the women from Nchangneng or Wondercorp, but they started organizing around the effects of the massacre on women, um, providing a source of support to women, but also addressing some of the underlying problems that had led to the, the, the mine worker strike. And these are questions related to social reproduction and the living conditions um, under which the majority of people stay there. They're hor horrifying. No services, no housing, water supplies that run out at midday. And these have great impacts on women in that community. So they've been organizing since then and they launched their organization some eight months ago. It's called Sakale Sonke. Basically, we cry together. And so we visited them and spent time with them, understanding the massacre through the eyes of women. I'd like to shift the focus away mm -hmm. from South Africa, if we can. Mm -hmm. Still maintaining a focus on South African companies, mining mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to get a sense of what's happening um, in other parts of the region. Mm -hmm. What is the impact of the mining companies, South African mining companies, mm -hmm. in other parts of Southern Africa? Mm -hmm. So the, the women meeting drew together women from all over the region. We had 16 countries represented, West Africa, Central Africa, East and Southern Africa. The majority of participants were from Southern Africa. And the impacts that I've described are generally ones common across the region. So from the environmental, social impacts, the unpaid labor question, violence against women. But the effects are very similar and in fact, um, if you hear stories around the impacts of extractors, industries on communities and women specifically, you literally could, you could blot out the name of the area and the country and the stories would read exactly the same, whether they're from uh, South Africa, the DRC, Nigeria or um, uh, Colombia. Um, so these, these are general trends and that's why it's really important that we are unifying our struggles regionally and internationally because the struggles are very much the same ones. In terms of South African mining capital, what we did discuss um, was we talked about um, unifying our efforts into a campaign against particular corporations and cooperating with others around a more general campaign. And which, which are those corporations? So we, we identified, it must have been about a hundred corporations on the list, but the ones that were sing, uh, singled out, and, and there's one South African, well historically South African mining corporation amongst them, and that's Anglo Gold. Barrick Gold, which is a Canadian mining corporation, was singled out as, as particularly problematic. Um, and there were a number, Shell, Chevron, Texaco, in terms of the oil industries, Newmont, um, in terms of mining. So the Anglo Gold came up as a particular focus for, for action. Anglo Gold um, regionally is present in, in Ghana and Mali as well as Guinea. So those are the, the countries that it operates in. Um, Human Rights Watch has done quite a lot of research in, in Ghana around the impact of Anglo Gold's activities there. Um, similarly, an organization called WACAM, which is doing excellent work on extractors in, in extractors industries in Ghana, is also mobilizing around Anglo Gold and its impacts. They're very similar to what I've described already, acid mine drainage, terrible environmental pollution, um, repression of communities that are resisting the activities of mining corporations. Um, and so I'm very excited about the possibility of us cooperating to target a South African 
uh, historically South African mining corporation in a regional campaign. Tell me, what does the Wellman program want to see happen in terms of change that will bring about some positive transformation in these women's lives? Mm. So when we started a few months ago, when we were thinking about how we could name WOM and identify it, we, we talked about African Women United against destructive resource extraction. And I think this, this is a, a major th thrust of our work going forward. It's not to say that no resource extraction should occur at all, but given the, the deep environmental and social impacts of the extractive sectors, um, we do need to be thinking about the model of extractives. And so this was something we spent a great deal of time talking about, was um, the model of extractivism and locating it in a wider system of capitalism. And so you have a rapacious, very violent, destructive form of extractivism that characterizes this, this particular phase of capitalism, and that is across the world today. Um, the, the sort of, there were different view, viewpoints around uh, extractivism. Um, certainly the, the one viewpoint from many of the participants was no to resource extraction altogether. Um, and so this reflects a, a common position globally, which is keep the coal in the hole, the oil in the soil. Um, however, there were many people in the room that felt that what we needed to do was actually work to make the extractives model, um, work to transform the, the model itself. And that would be to strengthen policy and law to provide protections, better regulate the mining industries to mitigate some of the worst impacts and ensure the voice of communities and women in particular around decision making with regards to the mines. I think these positions come together in that um, even those that felt that the model itself could be transformed um, were of the viewpoint that there needs to be significant transformation and that when there were, when there were indications that it, an extractor's project would carry too great a social and environmental impact, these extractor's projects should not proceed. And so the first major sort of focus of our work going forward then would be to strengthen the voice of communities, in particular women within these communities, to give input to decision making around these projects, to lift up their voices, to say no when the extractors project will be too detrimental to their livelihoods and lives. Um, the second sort of major thrust is a lot of communities are poorly informed, and women in particular, around the impacts of the extractive sectors. So the, the mining corporations come to communities with many promises. They come with promises of um, development, local development, jobs. Women, if, women have, have few opportunities to work on the mines. And in fact, the, the impacts, the negative impacts, well outweigh any investments by the, the mining corporations. The corporate social responsibility, responsibility programs are, are very small. And so, what we want to really do through Wellman is um, build a, a unified platform of women from mining affected communities to support exchanges, information and, and movement building on the continent. That's the second major thrust of our work going forward. Third is given that we do need to, in the long term we might want to see much more limited extraction, smaller scale projects, um, definitely locating extractives in local and regional development and not just driven by extractives for export, which is what's happening at the moment in terms of this model. Um, but what we do want to see is we'll be lobbying sub-regional and regional institutions to strengthen policy and law to ensure that women can be involved in decision making, that women's rights under communal tenure are strengthened so that they actually are seen as members of these communities and can give input around these projects. Um, what we would also want to see is um, with current trends of a lot of our governments really trying to capture more of the benefits of mining, that where this does occur, that there is significant local benefit and that that goes towards supporting development that um, women prioritise, that supports their labour and supports their development needs. Samantha Hargreaves, thank you very much for joining us at Saxis. Great, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at Saxis. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at saxis.org.za.